I read a story as I was kind of uh, Googling around about persecution this week, and the story was written by a man who had met this other guy who had been persecuted. He was arrested under the regime of, uh, of Saddam Hussein, and after, arrested for his fa- after he was arrested for his faith, he was interrogated, and they said, tell us the names of other Christians so that we can arrest them, so that we can persecute them too, so that we can torture them too, so that we can imprison them, so that we can stop the spread of Christianity in Iraq. That's basically the goal. And he refused, and when this guy who wrote the article met him, the man was missing fingers, plural. He had part of his ear missing. He was covered in cigarette burns. Uh, His feet were bare, swollen, oozing, bloody, and infected. Uh, They gave him the death sentence, but he escaped, and he he wandered around, uh, just to finish the story, uh, going to church to church, not a Christian, uh, excuse me, different story, but he he was saved, uh, and he was able to survive this persecution, uh, just wandered around the desert naked until he was helped. Now, when I think of stories like his, and you can tell by my mix-up there that I was reading other stories, and I think about our response to government, it's clear that at some point we must disobey government. That's clear. Uh, The Bible is, especially the New Testament, is a story about a lot of people uh, being persecuted and arrested and even killed at the hands of government for their faith. Uh, The story of Christianity is intertwined with decisions by Christians to disobey their government in order that the gospel will continue to move forward. Now, in our current world, current country, not our current world, our, our current situation in America, it's pretty easy to just look at the first four sermons in this series and, and the things that we've looked at in, in the Bible and go, well, yeah, that's kind of easy, you know? I mean, I can be obedient to government and still live out my faith, and it's easy to honor those in power because, you know, they're not going to bring the sword for my faith or anything like that. However, I envision a time when it might not be that easy for us. And I know that all around the world, it's not that simple for many people who are trying to follow Jesus. There is oftentimes a direct conflict between doing what is right, what God wants you to do, and doing what the government has told you to do, or not doing what the government uh, has told you to do. And the question becomes... What's the interaction with government when government has stopped supporting that which is good and started to uh, try to stop people from doing that which is good? And as I've gone through this series, I've really just wrestled, and early on in the series, I listened to another sermon kind of on the topic of God and government that brought up this, this topic, and it's, it's been difficult as I've thought through where the lines are, and it's the topic of civil disobedience. Let me just define that so we're all on the same page. The purposeful, nonviolent action or refusal to act by a, a, a Christian, this is Christian civil disobedience, by a Christian who believes such action or inaction is required of him or her in order to be faithful to God, and which he or she knows will be treated by the governing authorities as a violation of law. Now, you could just take away the word Christian, and that's civil disobedience in general. And we look back, let's just be honest, on many instances of civil disobedience in the history of our country, in the history of the world, and, and we go, well, obviously, that was a good thing. And I've really wrestled with this as we've gone through this series like, okay, I'm supposed to obey government, honor government, respect government, supposed to do all these things, but some of the people who are my heroes didn't do them, and were they, if they were Christians, wrong? 
in their actions of civil disobedience. And I've wrestled a ton with this. Where would I fall? What would I have done in, in certain situations, given what I've learned over the last four or five weeks in this sermon series? Uh, should we practice as Christians civil disobedience? Is there ever a time when we look at the government and say, no, I'm not going to do what you've told me to do? Or we look at the government and say, I'm going to do it anyway. I know you told me not to. And what are those instances if there are those instances? Like, I, I've just been asking like this. This was like the one that I hit on really early, like four or five weeks ago, and just started to think, like, what about the Boston Tea Party? I'm an American. I'm a fairly patriotic American. And I grew up like you in social studies class thinking, man, these guys were heroes for dressing up as, as Native Americans and throwing the tea off the boat. I mean, this was a heroic act that, that began in some ways the Revolutionary War, which is another question. What about the Revolutionary War that eventually gained us our freedom? Every 4th of July, we celebrate something that even was beyond civil disobedience because this was more like, to, to use our new kind of Portland terms, this was more like rioting, and then they started shooting. Should we celebrate that? If you went back in time knowing what you know now as, uh, as a person who's been through this sermon series with me, would you have been on the side of the revolutionaries? Or would you have stayed obedient to the British government? Or what about the Underground Railroad? People were getting black people out of the South, setting them free from slavery, in some instances saving their lives. I grew up with Harriet Tubman as a hero. I had a book about her as a kid. Was it right? Now, good it seems good, right? I mean, it did some good. It did a lot of good. feel like we'd be on their side, but if we could go back in time, would, would we have done what they did, and, and would we have done it with a clear conscience? Like, is that the right thing to do? Or what about those who hid Jews during the Holocaust? We celebrate them, and my feeling is that we should continue to celebrate them, and I think we'll see that in the Bible, that we should celebrate people that did that, but they were disobedient to the government. They were dishonoring in some ways to the government that, that they were underneath the Nazi regime. Should we be on their side looking back? If you were there, would you have been one of the people hiding Jews or what about the civil rights movement? This is an important question. Would you have been there marching with Martin Luther King Jr.? Now, given what you've seen in the Bible, would you have been there marching? Or would you have said, well, I really don't like what's happening, but I'm going to be obedient and honor my government like what the Bible says? Or what about these protests in Portland? It's not historical yet, and so it's hard to look back and say, well, did they accomplish any good, right? But what about them? Were they good? If really these people think that oppression is coming at the hands of a military leader, or were they inherently bad if people were Christians? They're not Christians. Again, they can do whatever they want when it comes to government. But if they're Christians, was it right to march down the streets? Was it right to back up traffic on I-5? And if it's not, what's the difference between them and the civil rights movement or the Boston Tea Party? Is it just that you don't like their cause and you like a different cause? Where are these lines? Now, I think it's almost more complicated because we live in the United States of America. Let me just read you some of what you'll know, and then, and then it will continue to a part that you don't know. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've heard that part. That to secure these rights... Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new, if I can turn my page, government. We live in a country that in some ways is founded upon the idea of being able to disobey, reject, turn against our own government. And so we feel in our country like civil rights can be gotten through the means of civil disobedience. But is that a biblical response? Or is it just the way we grew up because we had heroes that were disobedient to their governments and it produced things that we, most of us agree on, are good? That's the question that I want to just lay out there. And now I'm going to help you look at a bunch of the Bible and not going to answer the question. That's kind of the goal for today. I'm just going to lay a bunch out there, give you some very hard lines that the Bible makes, and then I'm going to ask you to leave. And and, I mean, not right away after I finish, we'll do a song and communion, but I'll ask you to go home. And and, and then I, I just want you to think through these things. That's kind of the plan. And primarily, we're going to look in Acts 4.12 because we see this, this story where it's quite clear they just disobey those who are in authority above them, and, and they are very uh, forthright about doing so. Here's, here's what happens. Uh, let me read you Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, This is the end of a sermon by Peter, and we looked at uh, Peter's letter last week, but this is the end of a sermon by Peter. He's preaching the gospel to people. He's saying, look, the the reason that we stand up and talk to you, the reason that we're going around sharing the news of Jesus is because we don't believe there's any other way to get into heaven. We don't believe there's any other way to be saved. We don't believe there's any other way to a relationship with God than through Jesus. Jesus than through believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world and Lord of all and giving your life to him. That's it. So Peter gives this sermon. He finishes with that. And then we read the response to the government officials that he's talking to. In 4.13, it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So Peter preaches brought in by the government authorities. Peter says, hey, this is the only way to be saved here. It's the only way. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And the first thing that these officials notice, I think this is profound and important when it comes to how we respond to government. They notice that they're unschooled, ordinary men. They don't know much. And yet they are courageous. Courage translates a word that means the speaking All one thinks. That is to say, free spokenness as a characteristic of frank and fearless mind, hence boldness or openness. So they're just impressed by the courage of Peter. And yet at the same time, and his friends, and at the same time, they look at them and they go, these people are are not, they're not smart. They're not educated. And here's what I just, find so interesting is that I think we've forgotten something about our Christian faith. We've forgotten what's said in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 31, but God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God shows the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, what I think we've forgotten is that Christianity has always been a a religion that connects with those who are disenfranchised, those who are hurting, those who have been pushed down by governments, and even those who aren't very educated. But in our current American culture, I've seen that Christians feel a need to act like they're as smart as everybody else. And you can clearly see this tendency when it comes to politics. 
I think that a lot of Christians don't think about the things that we've seen in the first four sermons in this series. And if you haven't listened to those, creeksidebiblechurch.org slash God and Gov. Go back and listen to them. But I think a lot of us don't feel a need to obey those things because we feel the same tendency as everybody else to sound smarter, to prove our points, to look like we know what we're talking about, to make other people look stupider than us. And so we attach ourselves to a political party and we say, I'm going to make myself look better than the other side. And, and here, Peter and his friends don't seem to feel that need. They just boldly come in speaking about one thing, the gospel of Jesus, because they remember what we said last week, that the true mission of Christianity is the great commission to lead every person to Jesus. And so they don't feel the need to come in looking smart or profound or coming in and saying, let me tell you why your laws are bad and and here's my religious explanation for why you ought to do authority the way that we say that you ought to do authority. They just come in and say, look, here's the deal. We We just know this that the only way to be saved is through Jesus, and so we're going to keep preaching Jesus. I want you to ask this question about your political involvement, your, your, your response to government. In it, are you only boasting in Jesus, or are you boasting in your, your rightness, your feeling of rightness, that you know more, that you're smarter than the other person, that you have a better way of doing economics, all those things? Because Christianity, in its very nature, should be a a faith where we only boast in Jesus and what he has done for us. The story continues. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, now, Peter, friends, had healed a man, which had led to the sermon, which had led to their arrest. There was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do to these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Let's be clear about this. The goal, the heart, the vision of many governments is to stop the spread of Christianity. Ever since Christianity has existed... Even in the person of Jesus, the goal in a lot of ways for many nations, many governments, many people in authority has been to stop the spread of this thing called Christianity. That has never changed. It's been 2,000 plus years of, of governments trying to stop the spread of Christianity. Those in authority that are not driven by Jesus have a tendency, will often do their best to stop Christianity from spreading. I don't know this, I haven't talked to any world leaders, but I think it's that when you reject Christianity, you are rejecting the truth, and it's much easier to try to push down that truth than just to flat out say that you've rejected it. I only believe that because I've seen that in people's personal lives. When people don't like something about Christianity, they reject it in their personal lives, then then they don't want to hear about it anymore, and they become angry when it's brought up, and they do their best to avoid it. I think that that's probably true for those in authority. But all over our world, people are hurting, as we mentioned in our prayer time, because governments want to stop the spread of Christianity. I read this story, and you can pray for this woman, about a lady named Susan. And I don't know the outcome of her life yet, but she became a Christian. Her dad found out she had become a Christian. And he... uh, tried to threaten her out of her Christianity. She refused to be threatened out of it. He opened up a shed, had a carpet in it, said, you stay on that carpet uh, until you're ready to deny Jesus. Locked the door behind her, left her for 30 days. He just put some some kind of scraps under the door and, and she actually, he poured water under so she drank mud, basically, in this shed. And... After 30 days, somebody was tipped off to what was happening and authorities were called and they actually came for Susan, authorities that were beyond the dad in in her culture. And they came and they got her and she was still on the mat. And they said, why are you still on the mat? And she said, because my dad said if I left the mat, it meant that I was rejecting Jesus. 
This is a woman who said, I will reject the authority of my dad, which is a major authority in many cultures, because I will not disavow Jesus. In Colombia, the National Liberation Army isn't allowing Christian meetings in homes or uh, outside pastors to be brought in to prevent the church from growing. It's currently happening today. Now, if a person there is uh, to be called by God to, uh, to have house church, then I would hope they would still do it, but that's the question for the day. Uh, an estimated, this is unbelievable, but uh, seems to be perhaps true, an estimated 50,000 people that are Christians are locked inside concentration camps because of their faith today. 50,000 people, and they face the, the threat of torture and mass starvation and, and even death in gas chambers. All over our world, 50,000 people. Last year, 2015, was the greatest year in the history of the world for uh, amount of Christians killed. The highest number of Christians killed in a single year ever happened last year. And, and the second most was the year before, 2014. There are people all over our world who are saying, I will not do what the government told me to do because I love Jesus too much. And we're going to see in just a second here out of the mouth of Peter why. But you must remember that Peter was a man who himself would give his life for his faith, for his beliefs. He would not disavow the things of God because he loved Jesus too much. The story continues in 18 through 21. Then they called him in again. And commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Let me read that middle section one more time. Which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Peter says, you are the authority but you're not my ultimate authority. Jesus gave us the great commission. The great commission was to tell people about him and what he had done on the cross, to baptize people in his name, to, to teach people to obey everything that he had said. And so it doesn't matter what you say to us, we are going to continue to preach the gospel. There's this crazy story in Acts 5, 17 through 30 where basically the same thing is, is said and, and there the disciples are arrested for preaching about Jesus and then they are miraculously released from prison and they go into the courtyard and they begin to preach the gospel again. It's an incredible story. They just didn't care. Like, oh, you're going to arrest us? Well, we're going to get free and we're going to stay the same stuff. It just doesn't matter to us. We're going to preach the gospel because Jesus t told us to, and we don't care. We do not care what the government says. We do not care what those in authority say because Jesus has told us to do it. And so the first thing, that is crystal clear when it comes to civil disobedience is that if Jesus, the Bible, has told you to do something and government tells you not to, you do it anyway. It's that clear. There is no, black, uh, there is no gray area. It is black and white in Scripture. If government says don't do something, but God has told you to do it, you just keep doing it. You just keep doing it. Exodus 1, there's this story. Now I'm just going to kind of get to a bunch of stories. Uh, and I think that they're all going to lead to questions that are important and valuable for us to ask. But a couple of hard truths that are, that are pretty important. Uh, and they're all wrapped up in this idea. When government declares that you don't do something, but God has said do it, you do it. And then the flip side, when government says you need to do this, but God has said not to, you still don't do it. And that's, that's seen in, this, in the first story. And Exodus 1, Pharaoh tells all the midwives in his nation, you are to kill 
every boy that comes out of the womb. You're just to kill him. And the midwives don't. They are obedient to God. We don't know if that's the reason, but they are obedient to what they know to be good. And in Exodus 1.17, it says, The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And Exodus tells us that God blessed them because of that disobedience. God said, you don't do that. Government said, you do it. And they said, we're not going to. And God responded favorably to that event. In Joshua 2, we read a story of a woman named Rahab. And in that story, Rahab hides Jewish spies because she knows that their God is going to be uh, more powerful than the gods that they served in, in her nation. And so she hides these Jewish spies. And the king comes and says, hey, I think you got the spies in there. And she even lies to him and says, I don't have the spies. She is dishonoring her king to hide these spies. The spies live and she lives and she actually ends up in the line of Jesus, the lineage of Jesus. And in James 2.25, we read about a picture of faith. And James uses Rahab as an example. In the same way, it was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. She says, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to do what my king wants me to do. And God uses her. Think about this. Uses her as an example of faith. In Daniel 3, we read this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you grew up in the church, then you've heard their story. Uh, But the story is an incredible story if you actually think about it. And don't just go, I've heard that one before. Uh, The king in their land, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he builds these giant gods and, and he says, hey, if anybody won't bow doubt down to them, then I'm going to burn them in a furnace. I'm going to burn them in a furnace. I'm going to kill them. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are God-fearing people. They know that they are not supposed to, to worship or bow down to any god except the God, Yahweh, the God that we serve. And, and so they don't bow down and they're, they're, they're questioned by the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And they're like, hey man, you can kill us if you want to, but we're not bowing to your gods. And he throws them in the furnace and, and they live, which is not always the case when we see persecution, but they live. In in Daniel 6, there's this incredible story of of Daniel, who the book is written after, and who's really high up in the government at the time, but there's a law created that says you you can't pray to any god but their gods. And, And the next thing we see Daniel do, it's an incredible story, is Daniel in the middle of the day goes up into his window and gets on his knees and prays. It's like he just I think he wants them to know, like, oh, bad law, I'll be here praying because God has told me to pray. And Daniel faces punishment. He's thrown in the lion's den. And he lives again. And then there's this harder story in Exodus uh, chapters 4 and 5, really. The story there is, that the Jewish people are all going to be killed at the hands of the Persian government. And Esther is a Jew, and she happens to be uh, the queen, the king's wife. Uh, I'm going to skip that part of the story. I don't know how you got there, but read Esther. It's a great book. I think they even made a movie if you don't feel like reading. And so Esther has a unique position, but she knows what she says in, in verse, uh, chapter 4, verses, verse 11. All the kings and officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. So here's a hard law. You cannot break the law that she's going to say next. That they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. The question is, do I go in there and try to save my people? Or do I obey the laws of the land? And Esther goes in and the people are saved. And she's looked at as a hero of the Jewish faith. 
So here's these examples. There's a few others, uh, a little bit more obscure examples in the Bible. But here's these examples where there is a direct conflict between that which God has declared and that which government has declared. And it still begs the question, what do we do with these things? How should we feel about the Revolutionary War, the Underground Railroad, or hiding Jews, or the Civil Rights Movement, or Gandhi's work, or the Vietnam protests, or the Portland protests, or people being arrested uh, because they are civilly being civilly disobedient to protest abortion or serving cakes or designing clothes or uh, being a conscientious objector. I mean, what do we do with all of these things that we talk about a lot, but what do we do with them given what we've seen here? It's a question that I think people have wrestled with since you know, almost the church began a guy named Marcellus in 298 AD said, I cease from this military service of your emperors and I scorn to adore your gods of stone and wood, which are deaf and dumb idols. If such is the position of those who render military service, that they should be compelled to sacrifice to gods and emperors, then I cast down my vine staff and belt. I renounce the standards and I refuse to serve as a soldier. He said, if you want your army to serve gods, I'm not even gonna be part of your army. It's not happening. So here's what I think the two extremes are. And I think that most of us fall on one side of this um, and probably a few on the other side. I think that if we are trying to be the hero of a story, then we are in the wrong. It's not in the Bible. There's people who do what God wants them to do. But if our thought is, I'm going to be a hero and I'm going to kick out the president and I'm going to get all the laws that I want and it's going to be me doing great things, then that's probably not right. Not a real example of that in scripture. But on the other side, and this is where I guess I lean, uh, is if we're just not doing anything because we're scared, then that's probably not right either. The Bible is a story that shows courage over and over and over again. Courage by those who love and serve Jesus. Now let me just give you some of these hard lines and, uh, and then you can, you can kind of pray and hopefully the Holy Spirit will lead you and you can come to your own conclusions about the things that you ought not do and the things you ought to do. Uh, first this. Jesus never fought for political rights. Do with that what you will. Some would say, let me just give you the response to that statement if it's pushing you one way or another. The response is, well, Jesus couldn't do anything about government and the rights that they were giving or not giving. And we who live in a democratic republic, we can. And so we should be more involved. And so you need to think through that, but just let's get it out there. Jesus didn't fight for political rights. In fact, Paul, who writes most of the New Testament, is sometimes looked down upon because he didn't fight for people's political rights. He doesn't say, do your best to abolish slavery. He says, if you're a slave, this is how you ought to act. And if you're a slave owner, this is how you ought to, ought to act as Christians. Remembering that you're both children of God and you ought to love each other and serve each other and, and be kind and gentle to one another. So here, Jesus and Paul, they just don't fight for political rights. They talk about, in fact, how to respond when your rights are oppressed. Jesus himself saying, when somebody asks you to go one mile, go two a reference to Roman soldiers grabbing a random Jewish guy and saying, carrying my stuff for a mile. Carry it. You're going to come with me. You're going to carry this. They didn't really have a choice but to be obedient to that. And Jesus says, when that happens, walk the second mile. Say, hey, I'll go, I'll go further if you need help carrying this stuff. There are clear statements that we should submit to and honor government in the Bible. We've talked about those the last couple of weeks specifically. It is crystal clear that no matter who your president is, no matter who's in charge of your nation, you ought to submit to and honor government. 
But that does not mean, because this is clear, crystal clear too, that does not mean that we blindly obey when it comes to a conflict with what God has told us to do or not told us to do. There are clear statements that show us that we are to obey God and not government when the two conflict with each other. We should share the gospel no matter what our government says. We should not bow down to an idol no matter what our government says. And we should obey all other commands, whether they are uh, commands to avoid or commands to fulfill, to do, no matter what our government says. That's crystal clear. Check this out. Biblical examples of civil disobedience are never acts of blatantly dishonoring governmental leaders. What you never see is them say, you're a stupid king, so I'm not going to obey you. What you never see is this king is an idiot, so I won't obey him. They just disobey. Daniel says, oh, you made a law that says I can't pray when I want to pray to whom I'm going to pray to. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to go out in the streets and proclaim that you are not on God's side. I'm going to pray. I'm just going to pray. You can do whatever you want to me. This, this is what we see. Even Esther, when she approaches her husband, she comes in in an honorable way hoping that he won't have her killed, but in an honorable way. When Paul and the other disciples talk to those who are in authority, even though those who are in authority are persecuting them, I think 100% of the time, I think 100% of the time, they do their best to show respect to those that God has put into authority. There are no instances that I know of where people dishonor their government. Save that uh, of disobedience to that government because it's in conflict with what God has called them to do. Now here's another thing, and you won't like this. At the same time, while they are being disobedient to government, what we find throughout scripture in the story of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Esther and uh, Paul and Peter, what you always find is, is that when they disobey government, they graciously, willingly, even joyfully accept the consequences that come to them. Now, if you're looking to start a revolution, you don't like that so much, right? Disobey, you say, okay, put me in jail. I broke your law. I broke your law. I should be thrown in jail, but I'm okay with that because I was doing what God wanted me to do. What you don't see is a fight, You don't see him flee the country. I disobeyed and I'm out of here. I disobeyed and I'm going to shoot back. I disobey and I'm going to resist arrest. They disobey and then they face the consequences. In one instance, really celebrating in the New Testament, the disciples after they are are beaten for preaching the gospel, celebrating that that they had been beaten uh, for the sake of Jesus and that they were counted worthy of suffering in the name of Jesus. Now, I don't know of one. Somebody might be able to find one. Go home, read the whole Bible, let me know. But I have not found one instance. I do not know of one instance in the Bible where there is civil disobedience simply to change the laws of that government. I do not see any example that we can point to in Scripture where people disobey government in order to get their way or even the way of a group of people. I don't see that anyway. And then I do see this so clearly. There are examples of civil disobedience to save lives. That happens multiple times in scripture. When somebody's life is on the line, it appears that we have the right to disobey government. If a Nazi soldier is going to kill a Jewish man, then you have the right, then you had the right to hide them in your closet, even though the government said not to. The Bible has multiple examples of that. Let me just kind of finish this series with two things. 
Uh, one, just something that I believe with all my heart. And, and two, uh, a, a letter I wrote to Donald Trump uh, because you were supposed to do that in your sermon series booklet this week. I want to say this, that our greatest hope, because it's easy to look in our country right now and say, maybe this is the moment when civil disobedience, and, and you really need to think through all these things that I've said. Don't just say it feels right. Don't just say it'll, it'll accomplish something. In fact, one sermon I heard, that was kind of the idea. If there's a lot of people who feel the same as you, and you think it will accomplish something, that's the moment that Christians are to be disobedient to their governments. But I just don't see that. Think through these, these things that I've said here. But remember that our greatest hope for never having to face these questions the way that Peter and Paul and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Esther face them isn't found in a politician but in a savior. Our greatest hope for never having to lay our lives on the line for our faith is not found in a politician but a savior. Getting someone in an office will never make a nation a Christian nation. But a nation full of Christians will definitely make our nation more Christian-like. I think that's been at the heart of every sermon in this series. Is that it's not about getting the right person elected. It's not about having our laws in place that line up with our morality. It's about leading every person to Jesus and to full obedience to Jesus. And if we do that, I don't think we'll, we'll ever, ever have to face a time where we might be killed for proclaiming the name of Jesus, where we'll be asked to bow down to idols and have to say no at the threat of being thrown into a furnace. I want to finish with this letter because it's it's my heart that's come out of this series and I I think it should be close to your heart too. I would have written the same thing to uh, Hillary Clinton. President-elect Trump, First, congratulations on your victory in the election. Second, we know that many have been and will be highly critical of you. Our family is a Christian family, and we are committed to honoring you with our words and supporting you through prayer. We don't agree with many of your stances on issues, but this won't deter us from being respectful of you, something we've been throughout the election. We believe it is now your duty to serve God in the role of president. We hope that you will fulfill this role with diligence and excellence. We are praying for this. Our primary prayer is that you would become a Christian, accepting Jesus as both your Savior from sin and Lord of all. If you want to know more about this, you're welcome to reply to this letter. We will answer any questions we can. Our second prayer is that your goal will be to honor God in your decisions. We can't imagine the complexity of those decisions and don't pretend to know how we would fall on certain things if we had all the information. Our prayer isn't that you do everything that we want. Our prayer is that you try to do all that God wants. President-elect, we are on your side because you are now God's servant and we serve him. May God lead and bless you, the Harms family. We are to honor our government, no matter who our government is, until it conflicts with what God has called us to do and then we disobey them and face the consequences. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that, uh, man, I I just, this church, Lord, uh, I just ask that we would be a church that responds to government correctly. Lord, we who are Christians have a terrible reputation for being too political, for being jerks when it comes to politics, for pushing our our agenda politically onto people that don't believe like us. And I pray, God, that uh, this church would not be that. I do pray, Lord, that we would be a church of courage, not, Lord, needing to look like we're smarter than everybody, not needing to look like we are always right, but always boasting in you, Jesus, and what you have done for us on the cross and through your resurrection. I, I pray, Lord, that our mission would always be the Great Commission and not to get somebody elected. I pray, Lord, that we would love you enough to die for you if it ever comes to that, God. And I pray that we love you enough, Lord, to suffer, to be punished, 
in order to do all that you want us to do, God, whether that be save lives or anything else. God, I pray for the wisdom uh, of your spirit to just touch our our people here, God, and and those who would listen online, because these are complex issues. Uh, I don't know exactly when it's right to protest and when it's not, but I pray, God, that we wouldn't just do what we want, but we would do our best to do what you want. We live in a a complex time, God, but that's nothing new, Lord. Um, God, I, greatest show of all time, Lord, the wonder years. Uh, They faced all the same decisions, Lord. Uh, All the same decisions about when to protest, when not to, when uh, our morality comes in conflict with government, all those things. And uh, it's just been an issue forever. And I pray, God, that we would know how you want us to respond and, and We would do our best to faithfully serve you in that. God, be with President-elect Donald Trump and all of our other elected officials. I pray, God, that what they do would not force us to make these decisions uh, in any magnified way. I pray that they would make decisions, Lord, that allow us to do that which is good freely. And, And I pray, God, that they would punish that which is bad. That's their job now, Lord, and I pray that they would accept it and do it well. Love you, Lord. Thank you for the series. Pray that we would live it out, live out the words we've seen in your word. Uh, be Christians that no matter if we disagree people with people, people will look at us and go, they love Jesus and they love others. I pray these things in your name.